Hello, everyone. This is Ernie Humphrey, the CEO and CEO of Treasury Webinars. Um, I would like to thank you for taking the time to join us for our webinar today. Visibility is king, relationships, payments, fraud, and technology. As those of you who listen to me over the years know, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. You know I'm going to say it. You can't manage what you can't see. Well, the good news is that uh, that really companies are really investing more in technology. We've seen people really interested in that technology stack. And I think one of the things that Lessons COVID has taught us is that we need visibility right into what we're doing. And so for me, one of the most important things about visibility is it helps us manage relationships more effectively, whether that's our suppliers, our customers, our internal team, right, our bank relationships. And so we'll talk through that. Uh, and then we'll do some focus in on payments because obviously um, that's more important than ever. A lot of things going on the payments front, and of course, related to payments is fraud. And then we'll uh, overarch everything, of course, as we always do on the technology side, because really it's technology that really empowers best practices. And most importantly to me, um, technology allows us to own our time and focus on only value add activity. So before I dig in, I want to welcome uh, one of my favorite speaking partners, um, John Paquette. He is the head of customer service in the U.S. for TIS. So, John, welcome to the web. And I want you to give us a little bit about your amazing background and give us a few words about TIS and what's going on in the U.S. here. Yeah, sure, I can do that. So, I'm John Paquette, head of customer success in the U.S. market. So, uh, you know, my background is all in the treasury space. Before joining TIS, I had 15 years experience as a treasury practitioner, most recently as a uh, treasurer for a large healthcare organization. Um, so before joining TIS in, in 2019, and for those not familiar with TIS, we're a specialized provider really in the payments and banking activity space. So uh, glad to be here today, and Ernie, thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, John. So uh, as always, um, John and I are going to have an interactive conversation today. Uh, I also want to thank uh, TIS for being our webinar partner today. They are one of my longest and most valued thought leadership partners. I think I've been working with TIS probably five or six years now. And I appreciate their commitment to thought leadership, but also serving the treasury profession. And so I sincerely appreciate that uh, from my partner TIS. So they do, they do some, they're doing some great things. They've always done great things, but there's more of a focus um, in the U.S. this year. So let's all uh, pay attention um, as they, as they do a little bit disruption in our market. And I'm happy to help them do that. So a uh, few housekeeping items before I forget. Uh, anyone interested in receiving CTP credits for today's webinar? You'll have to answer all the polling questions during the webinar, stay on for the duration of the webinar, and you will also have to answer the short survey that will launch immediately following the webinar. Regarding polling questions, I appreciate everyone's consideration in answering all the polling questions and in taking our short survey. We always strive to improve the ROI we offer our event attendees for their valuable time, and that's more important than ever. We realize uh, that folks have been consuming much more uh, content and thought leadership and looking for professional development right um, in these in these uh, challenging times by by virtual and so I understand um, and I think that's what's always set me apart I like to say we do webinars uh, with personality so also um, if you have any questions regarding CTP credits or would like a copy of today's presentation please send an email to Ernie at treasurywebinars.com again that's Ernie at treasurywebinars.com all right, so what's our agenda for today? So let's, we're going to talk about the CFO and Treasury priorities. And the good news is for Treasury is that we are up to the plate. So you better have the right bat in your hand and you better be ready to take a big swing. So, that, so that's one of the great things about, not great things, there's no great things about COVID, I should say that. But, but one thing that is, has been nice to see is Treasury is in front. You're in front of the CFO, you're in front of the CEO, you might be in front of the board, so you need to make sure you're ready to do that. And then we'll talk about how to deliver treasury success, which I think is incredibly important. I started focusing on this more last year. We talk about metrics, and I'm doing a survey on metrics coming soon. But how do you deliver treasury success? And also, what does that mean for your company? And then we'll do a little dive into payments and talk about payments efficiency and risk mitigation. And then we'll talk about um, something I've been talking about for the last I don't know, three or four years, maybe more than that, maybe 15 years, I should go there. Um, we need to understand the why of cash movements. And so now with all this technology and visibility, we can focus on understanding the why. So it's extremely, extremely important to have the bank reporting on the what, but we also need to understand the why. 
The why gives us predictability, allows us to optimize cash movements. And then as always, we'll give you some key takeaways as we want you to be able to really see before we, we part ways today is a way that you can improve cash management, your company, ask the right questions, um, make a new connection. And so just some, some uh, research data, which I always love and I always loved as a practitioner, um, some survey from the uh, Workday CFO indicator survey, just to kind of show why this is important, why we have the CFO's attention and why they're gonna listen to us. Isn't, wouldn't that be a nice change of pace, right? So as they navigate to a new normal, I like to call next normal, what's important, right? Uh, prioritize, you know, what? so we're still prioritizing, right? Immediate response, well, now it's a response. It's not going away. We're all gonna work in a hybrid environment. It's, you know, that's just the way it goes. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just need to make sure that we empower our folks to have productive agility. That means working from home, right? Going back to the office, whatever that looks like. And so we see revenue projection. All right, that's right up our alley, right, Treasury folks? Revenue projection, what does that mean? That means cash forecasting. That means accounts receivable. That means optimizing our customer relationships, understanding the impact that we have on the customer experience. Ooh, supplier relationship management. Ah, we need visibility for that, right? Cash and liquidity management. So I'm just like, so you should all be excited uh, about this. So if you don't have the, the attention of your, your uh, CFO, you should, right? So that's a good thing. And so let's talk about how do you measure success? And so we talk about visibility. How are we measuring success? Well, cash forking, forecasting accuracy has been up there a long time. I think we need to get away from that. Not that it's not important. It's more about is our accuracy improving our decision? And if I could tell you, what you should measure yourself on, tell your CEO, I would say your cash conversion cycle, right? That's really what matters. How are, how are we empowering better decisions regarding how we deploy our cash, but also better decisions on how we manage our relationship? Um, the other thing is bank fee and bank free trends, which we'll be talking about, uh, absolutely important uh, in today's world. And, and I would say the other thing that we should start to look at, you know, are the, uh, are the fees, right, from our other, the other folks, right, in the, in the treasury management system. So we're so we might be spending money, but right? we might be managing an, an AP solution, an AR solution. Hopefully, we have uh, a best of breed approach um, in managing our cash. And so I think that'll be important. So how do you deliver uh, treasury success? So before I uh, dive in here, let's go ahead and kind of level set the stage. And I really want you to share with me um, what are the which of the following. I know you might have another, but I don't want to give another. I don't want to give you an out. Which of the following represents the highest treasury priority or I have slash priorities for your company in 2021? Oh, I did give you none. Please don't, don't do none. Uh, you know, improving cash visibility, fraud prevention and compliance, technology, systems integrability, bank relationships, bank account management. I realize some of these uh, things are a little bit um, interrelated. So please, please, please um, answer the question. Even if you don't want CTP credit, all you gotta do is click on click on the button for me. So we'll go ahead and leave the polling question up um, for another few seconds, and then we'll take a peek. I'm still gonna do my my sports countdown because the NCAA tournament's going on, even though I'm still in mourning um, that my Purdue Boilermakers uh, took an early exit. So any Boilermakers out there, uh, you have uh, my sympathies as well. But what? But I think we have a good team for next year. So let's go. Three, two, one. All right. Let's go, let's take a quick peek here uh, at the results. And so, good news, right? You're on the right webinar. Well, all these things we're gonna address, right? Improving cash visibility. I'm really glad that that's a focus and people are realizing how important that has been. I mean, to me, I think we've always talked about it. And part of that might've just been in the past, it was so difficult, right, to even achieve that. I mean, I was back in the day trying to work with uh, MT, 940s. John, John, let me bring you in here. You, you, you know, you, you were probably had that struggle as well, right? Just getting visibility into your bank accounts, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's always a big topic for most organizations is getting more visibility into your bank accounts. And I bet there's a lot of companies out there that as they went to work from home, realized that maybe they didn't have the right tools in place to really get that full cash visibility picture into all their accounts too. So not surprised, but, you know, very happy to see that being the, uh, the top um, priority for most companies uh, this year. Now, you bet. And I know John's also happy to see fraud prevention and compliance there because those are things that are really, really sweet spots um, for TIS. Actually, they just announced a big partnership um, with, with Deutsche Bank 
So congratulations on that. So they're so great at this that Deutsche Bank, uh, you know, is really partnering with them on the fraud prevention and compliance side. We have upgrading technology and systems integrability. And then we, we, we hey, John, I did a pretty good job on coming up with these polling questions. We only got 2% that, that, we, that we didn't nail it on the head. So I'm going to give myself a pat on the back. All right. So let's go ahead and let's start to, you know, dive in just a little bit here. Um, so some of you may have seen this before, but these things should be top of your mind. But first and foremost, you have to define treasury success. We talked a little bit about that. What does that mean at your company? And so that's extremely important. Not only does it need to drive your decisions, it also helps you communicate your value, right, to the rest of the organization, to the CEO, to the CFO. So what does that mean? Where are we adding value? So what is it that defines the value for our company and how is treasury contributing to that by our actions? So as a manager or treasurer, it's, it's how do I incent the actions that are driving value that I can measure and tie, right? Two big ways for us in treasury. One of them is mitigating costs, which is okay, but it also in, in uh, reducing the time that people spend on unvalued activity, we're also driving growth and also better relationships, right? With our suppliers and customers means growth and we need to communicate that and give some sort of metric of that. It's a little bit of an indirect effect, but it's there. I talked about this, understanding time spent on non-value add activities. I should have asked a polling question. How many of you treasury leaders out there know how much time is being spent by your staff in each area on non-value add activities? I would probably get a squeaky silence. Believe me, I've been there. So just ask the question, right? And then, you know, have a conversation. Okay, what can we do to mitigate the time you spend on non-value add activities? What can we do in terms of technology, in terms of process, in terms of training, right? You need to understand the skills of your treasury team, right? And and for for me, I I used I like diversity um, of your team. Certain people have certain skill sets. Obviously, as we talk about business partnering, we're expected to communicate across enterprise. We need some folks that have those soft skills. So I know you don't want to believe this, but every treasury department needs an Ernie. And John's like, oh, I don't know if we go that far. Well, maybe every treasury department needs a John. I think that will be okay. All right. You need to understand your current systems. And then you need to assess your current relationships, right, with your internal treasury customers. So maybe AP and AR, right, don't report up through you. Okay, who else is our customer? Maybe we're giving data across the enterprise. Let's be cognizant. And what about our external partners? We need to learn how to be how to be uh, good customers here. John, let, let me bring in here uh, these like top five things. Um, which of these top five things do you think is the most important driver for treasury success? Yeah, I mean, I think in the in the world today, because tech, uh, treasury technology or treasury is so focused on technology these yeah. days, I think understanding your current systems is definitely yeah. an important factor here. It plays right. into a lot of these other ones as well, you know, uh, in terms of uh, time spent on non-value add activities that could be due to a lack of you know efficient technology within the treasury department too. So I tend to learn lean towards the technology space, and I think that that's an important one for yeah. for treasury organizations. Yeah, I agree. I think what dovetailing is just that's what really empowers your best practices so you have the time right to understand the skills you have the time to spend on your relationships which are incredibly important and a little bit more challenging because we need to learn how to manage our relationships in a more virtual environment um you need to dovetail to dovetailing on what john just said you need to identify your technology gaps and assess your needs you need to do the same thing on your skill set and so what are the gaps right where are we Right. Where where are we? Where do we want to be? Where do we need to be? And then what resources do we have to get us there? Do we need to spend money? Do we need to retrain and all that good stuff? And it, this is my soapbox. I would love AP and AR to report up through Treasury uh, as a way of life just because it's a big cash conversion cycle. So if you don't own AP, collaborate with them to take more control of payments, collaborate with AR to take more control of receipts. What's the best way to do that? To see what's going on. In all the relationships, all the dynamics to see what it is, analyze it, right? Share, share with your internal teams, right? That visibility is the foundation uh, for, for treasury success. Uh, you need to invest in relationships internally within your department and beyond and with your and with your uh, relationship fires. Now, now I'll, I'll confess, when I was a treasury manager many, many moons ago, I wasn't the best at this, so they probably snicker uh, when I talk about this, but especially the banks, your banks and service providers should be your partners. And now they have more in them, send them to do so because there's so many amazing 
technology companies in there, right, that are that are really driving into their treasury services revenue. Um, customers, we need to understand how we're impacting the customer experience, also the the supplier experience. So those are my those are my uh, ten tips. And a bit at the excuse me at the foundation of success is visibility. Visibility is empowered by technology. So how do you deliver treasury success? So, so let's talk about how to collaborate. Uh, let's talk about how to collaborate with your banks. Cash management success, right? You might use your TMS. So 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 let me let me broaden that a little bit as I'm thinking about this with your banks, your treasury management service provider. So 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 let's put a little line there. And before you can collaborate, you have to communicate. I think people miss that. We talk about collaboration all the time. It doesn't happen unless you have open and honest communication. And so uh, I love this diagram here, right? Um, your communication, right? Your connections, uh, yourself, right? Your staff, right? With everyone that's outside of those service providers. Who's your relationship manager? Who's who's your support for your team? And then collaboration, right? How do we build a mutually beneficial relationship? And that's all about productivity, uh, productivity and intelligence. And so for me, um, what I've seen, especially the last probably five years since I've started working with TIS is I really didn't understand how complicated the digital communication side was. And 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 that was and that was even before COVID hit us. So we'll dive in there um, a little bit. So so let's talk about um, the dimensions of communication here. Um, so we have um, the electronic side, right? Digital message has become more, um, of a focus. The messaging is extremely complicated. Um, a lot of you might not really realize how much time your IT IT team has spent doing this. Um, even some of the the, the treasury, uh, when treasury managed system providers won't do this for you. <clears throat> There's a lot of work that goes into those formats, communication, the information reporting, and then of course um, the bank fee statements, which we'll talk about here. And then uh, the in-person side, right? Um, you want to have your when it's when it's safe, right? Bank group meetings, individual bank meetings, and industry events. So let me put in-person. I should have put slash virtual because now your bank group meetings might need to be virtual. Your bank meetings may need to be virtual if you wanna do those <coughs> quarterly. And then finally, you're, well, obviously you're seeing today your industry events are gonna be virtual. And so let's make sure that when we do that, we make it as in-person as possible. Let's make sure that we have our cameras on. Let's make sure that we have that engagement going uh, at all times and then everyone is not uh, multitasking here. And so here's kind of a little, a place here right you have to uh, understand uh the how the digital and so john let me go ahead and bring you in here to walk us through this slide yeah sure i can do that and i mean so first of all i think that there's a lot of different ways that have emerged to communicate with your banks whether it be e-banking tools you know host host connections apis swift so there's no it's no wonder that a lot of organizations have ended up with a something that looks like the, the diagram on the left hand side here a lot of different connectivity methods in use and really, you know, not a good mapping of even how you know, different systems are communicating with their banks today. Um, so this obviously is a, is a tough process to keep a lot of visibility over. It leads, a lot, le leads to a lot of inefficiencies, but also a lot of risks within an organization as well. Uh, and so there is a simple strategy to do this, obviously, you know, and it's, it's through utilization of a connectivity hub that really is able to simplify, unify, and standardize these communication protocols between uh, your back office uh, systems and your banks and so this is one component we're going to get into a bit more over the next couple of slides here but really you know the the key here is one point of access for your organization to its banking partners and eliminating all these different channels and the corresponding you know kind of uh technical components you simplify with doing that yeah thanks john i think the the right was probably a dream that i had right when i was back in treasury in the early 2000s and so uh, i'm glad to see this has become a reality and, and, I, and, I, and I miss almost being in treasury except for uh, certain things. Um, so let's talk about um, cost efficiency. So in addition to communicate, you have to make sure you're doing it efficiently. Because as I mentioned before, it can be extremely costly and the digital messaging can be a money pit, right? So you have to understand how much time does your IT team spend, right? On all these formats. For me, um, when I was in treasury, we had all these files going back and forth to the bank to, I'll use the name because they're no longer business, to Wachovia and all these things. And I was like, they got frustrated and they were, they were doing our positive pay file. So how much time does your IT team spend? Um, and what does it cost your company for the hours that they spend? Um, how much are your banks charging you, right? Are there information reporting fees? 
uh, what are they charging you for? I don't know what ch charring is. I, ho I hope they're not doing that, but charging you. So does your TMS, if you have a TMS, you need to know do they manage communication and format dynamics, right? These things are con continually changing. I wish banks would all use the same format, but they don't. So, so let's be careful about this and let's be careful um, that we understand all the things that our TMS provider can do, which is a lot of great things, but what they're not doing. And then what is the cost of what, what they don't do? And that can be tremendous on digital me uh, messaging. And then overall, how much money does your company spend communicating with your banks, but also I should say slash, uh, you know, TMS, uh, whatever, providers as well. And so th this is just things that I don't think I thought enough about, but in today's world, we have that visibility so we can get that into that communication. And so what does collaboration require? Our communication size, right? And so bank communication, I'll call this the personal, the relationship success. This is a whole uh, different webinar, which, which we'll do later this year. It requires you meet in person when possible, understand each bank's Ray Rock model. And so you need to understand your value to your bank. Uh, hopefully they'll share that with you. And so you need to understand, oh, this, this service for me, right? It's offering value uh, to my bank partner, okay? Your credit. And another thing is you wanna make sure your credit rating is right so you're not getting charged too much for the credit that you want access to. And you need to ensure your bank really understands your company, right? Um, what you're doing or strategic direction. And so treat them uh, like a partner. The more information they have, the better they can be at serving your needs. Nothing was more, well, I didn't say nothing. It was aggravating to me when a, my bank would come to me and just try and sell me everything under the sun. It's like, well, first of all, I don't need that. And second of all, that's not what your bank does best. And so you want to have expectations with your bank, trust, right? Proactive communication, honest communication. And so for some companies, this is really important in 2020 as your business model change. Uh, you, you might have been in a place where you had to ask for some loosening covenants. You had to tell your bank, oh, uh, you know, I'm going to miss my covenants and you want to be honest. So I would imagine if you didn't tell your bank, right, and you missed your covenants, well, guess what? They weren't too happy and they might have, you know, called something due. We don't want that. But then set and reset relationship expectations as necessary. And so this is something I've been preaching since last year at this time, if not before, Call your banks, right? Uh, see, you know, see if it's see if you need to re reset expectations. Anyway, right? What you're doing for them, what they're doing for you. Now, uh, John, I knew I know that you were deeply involved in bank relationships. Uh, uh, you know, in your when you were a treasury leader. So, w what do you think um, the success that you had? W what do you think was the most important component of your relationship management style that worked for you? Yeah, so I think you have a couple of points on here that are really good points there. You know, understand the relationship both from both sides. So the bank understands you and you understand the bank well in terms of, you know, how you're utilizing that, that bank relationship. And then the proactive communication with the bank, you know, the, the meeting uh, more frequently, um, really kind of informing the bank about how you're using them, how they're using you. Um, this is an element I think that the the uh, connectivity model really plays into well uh, as well because the better that you can visualize that traffic, how you're using these, these banks, how you're you know transacting with these banks, what your balances are, the better position you're in to have these conversations. I think in terms of services that you're using, you know, when fee negotiations come up, um, services that you can scale back on, or even opportunities the bank can help you more. So I think having that full understanding of the relationship is is really important. Right. Let me just hop in here before we move slides. Just if any of you haven't heard, I'm sorry, I apologize. I use an acronym, RARA. Uh, it means return on assets, return on capital model. We're actually having a webinar, I think next month, and, and we'll really dive in um, to what that means, how it's used, and how you can uh, collaborate with your bank um, once you kind of alignment on that uh, RARA model. Uh, how do you deliver treasury success? So uh, it's time to uh, talk some payments. And so um, I, I was fortunate enough to be to be working uh, with TIS, and there was an incredible story that they have from a customer, um, Attico, and it, what, what they called it was payments harmonization. So I wanted to get, so I wanted to have John um, kind of walk through uh, this process. And the amazing thing is, is, is this was probably done right uh, a little while ago. And so the foresight uh, that this company had was amazing. So John, I'll let you drive us through the next several slides. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So, I mean, this is a great case study. I definitely recommend anybody checking it out who has um, interest in this connectivity topic, though. But, um, yeah, I mean, ADECO probably on the more complex scale for organizations, a lot of connected systems, a lot of bank relationships. 
um, primarily in the staffing business. So they're executing payments, you know, everything from AP payments in your common, you know, bank country combinations to some salary payments in really exotic markets. So really diverse payment ecosystem here. And really what they were looking to get away from was, um, you know, multiple different systems to the banks, managing multiple different channels between all these back office applications and almost having to manage this like they're separate processes. They wanted to unify it all, really have centralized connectivity and visibility and have something that they could scale with going forward. So, you know, moving to the next slide here, how did they really accomplish that? And, you know, the point Ernie made, I think, is a really good one. The way they address this project is, is really the connectivity topic on their own, which was, I think, abnormal at the time. It wasn't, you know, in combination with a TMS rollout, thinking about bank connectivity or with um, an ERP migration, for example. They viewed this connectivity and payments topic as, a, as an important enough one to address as its own project, which was, which was great foresight. And I really saw that that was the, um, the engine, so to speak, that really um, would facilitate the, the tangential efficiencies they were looking to accomplish here. So, I mean, overall, what they were looking to do here was really standardize these communications to the banks, not having to worry about different protocols for different banks, um, achieve total system interoperability. So, you know, multiple different back office systems able to connect to the banks without them having to worry about the um, the, uh, the the kind of connectivity protocols in, in between and have this true end-to-end -end payments channel, right? So um, how did they accomplish this? You know, more specifically, if we move to the next slide here, we have, um, you know, kind of a visual representation of maybe what they were dealing with pre prepayment hub. Um, it'd be tough to get all their systems and banks into one diagram. So this is just a, a small representation of really what they were dealing with here in the old world slide here. Um, but, you know, looking to really get to what is essentially one point of entry for all their banking relationships through a centralized hub, right? And there's some um, components to consider here in terms of um, how the ERP systems are able to connect to the hub or if they were trying to do this to banks uh, in, 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 uh, on their own. Um, that's really simplified through the, through the hub here in terms of providing multiple different ways for those systems to integrate past files that's, that's more managed by the provider itself and, and lifts that complexity out of their hands. And then likewise, like I mentioned, the bank connectivity, um, you know, there's all sorts of different ways these days to connect to banks, whether it be you know, APIs, SWIFT, host to host connections and things like that too, um, that they didn't want to contemplate. They really wanted this managed through that single point of contact. The provider makes the connections to the banks and they just leverage this channel back and forth. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, John, Ernie, let, let me jump in here uh, a moment. I'm sure you're going to touch on this, but if memory serves me correctly, um, one of the many drivers of this uh, was that they had payroll accounts in just uh, how many countries I don't remember it seemed like a hundred right and so sometimes it seems like the complication in getting the information that you have is really driven right by the payroll because it's really hard not to have a local bank in in many countries that's exactly right yeah if you think about you know a staffing company what they might have to deliver for payments uh, from a payroll standpoint it could be like a, a check print file and you know yeah. Peru for example that needs to be delivered to in order to pay that um that beneficiary. So that was a, a huge uh, complexity with this particular product as well and something that they were definitely looking to solve through this model here. So, um, and this is a great slide that I think um, kind of highlights some of the complexities from a format perspective. So multiple different back office systems, like we mentioned, multiple different regions, they could all be outputting different formats, whether it be, you know, a CSV structure from a payroll system or a NACHA file, an XML file, a, an IDOC, whatever it might be, right, uh, depending on the, the, the system in use there. Um, likewise, the treasury system in the, in the mix here that was initiating treasury payments as well um, that might be uh, exporting different formats out as well. And all of those really going into a centralized uh, source, it's not only the connectivity channel to the banks, but also completing all these format transformations, really unifying everything from a, from a protocol standpoint. So regardless of what you know, they initiated out of their back office system, it would be delivered to the banks through the right channel in the, in the format that the bank was expecting. And then you know, not only the delivery of the file to the bank, but also the two-way communication back. So the, the actual file coming back into their systems to um, confirm that those transactions were actually executed successfully, right? So that simplifies obviously immensely um, the reconciliation piece of things and gives a great deal of visibility over this whole process. So, I mean, this was really a huge amount of complexity to pull out of this uh, organization's uh, process. Um, it allowed them to standardize things quite a bit and also have a model going forward that was really scalable so that they knew, you know, if new systems came in the mix, if new banking relationships, even in exotic markets like Ernie mentioned, came into play here, they had a model for how to incorporate it in and keep the same standardized process in place. So large efficiencies picked up on this on this respect, yeah. 
And this, you know, not to get lost just on the technical components here, there are also a lot of operational components that were picked up uh, through routing everything through the hub as well. So, you know, if you think about many different back office applications initiating payment files, they might all have different ways that payments can actually be approved. So depending on the system, maybe there's dual approval capabilities in place, or maybe, you know, uh, some payroll systems just have the ability to actually export out a file. Likewise, bank portals have different, um, you know, requirements and, and abilities to initiate a payment approvals directly on e-banking portals as well. But routing through everything through a centralized payment um, hub allowed them to layer on whatever approval powers they wanted to, regardless of uh, the ERPs and scope or the bank relationships that the, the files were being delivered to, right? So if they wanted dual approval across all payment files, uh, that could be done. If they wanted to pass certain low value payments directly to the banks, that could be done. If they wanted to have different threshold based approvals based on certain transaction amounts, uh, that could be done as well, but, you know, really taking the complexities that the systems play out of scope completely and just focusing on the transactional activity itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah John. I mean, to me, one, one of the things that really sticks out to me here is I'm thinking ahead a little bit. I don't want to uh, trump what you have coming, but to me, it seems like uh, the, the amount of payment risk exposures that they had would really go down, right, quite a bit. And so they, this had to really tighten up the audit trail and the risk exposures that they had as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about uh, managing this process without ma without centralizing through a hub, it's almost like you're managing as many different processes as you do as ERP systems, because you know none of nothing's really standardized in a way. None of the approval processes or the communication processes to the banks. So yeah, for sure, there was there was huge um, risk mitigation as a result. So um, success factors here. Every point on here, I think, is a, is a good one and an important reason why this project was such a success. But I think that you know, really, the factor for me was um, the strong leadership team in Treasury, who really understood these challenges. Uh, they knew where they wanted to get to. They knew the barriers, you know, that to getting there in terms of connectivity, the systems and scope, the bank protocols, um, and they really focused specifically on addressing that one problem, right? And um, you know, aside from that, they really worked well, I think, across various different departments to look yeah. outside of just Treasury and look at the payment process as a whole to understand the efficiencies that could really be gained um, through through a strategy like this. So I think the team did a great job um, and was really ahead of their time in terms of uh, the, the strategy they put in place here. Um, not to get lost on just the efficiencies that picked up, that they picked up here in the process. So Ernie also mentioned a couple of good points here in terms of risk mitigations and you know I guess where exactly do those risks exist within the organization. I think this diagram does a good job of showing that, right? So um, at this first point here, you have the organizational structure itself. How is the organization structured in terms of centralized versus decentralized? Are there shared service centers involved? Um, are there responsibilities handed down regionally? Um, and how many people are involved in that process? That plays into factors like training, um, access restrictions for, for systems, multi-factor authentication, the approval process you put in place, and you know, kind of how, how standardized you can have those across the organization, um, which obviously there's risk there depending on how that's handled. Um, from an IT system perspective, the more IT systems involved, the more you know, applications that are initiating payments, uh, those processes could look different system to system. The formats could look different. The um, abilities to initiate approval uh, uh, workflows and things within those systems could vary. So there's risk there as well. And then ultimately the banking relationships, right? That's a big variable as well um, in terms of uh, securing the protocols for how these files are passed back and forth to the banks, encrypted, not encrypted, how the authentication is occurring, is it, is it straight through processing or is the file drop somewhere? So um, definitely a lot of different layers here that organizations need to consider when they're securing these processes. Um, and as we move to the next slide here, you can see, I think, ex exactly why, you know, um, as a result of the survey that the survey results here highlight, and I think also just the conversations that we have um, on a day-to-day -day basis, the most common forms of fraud that most organizations are facing these days, business email compromise, uh, fake, fake invoice fraud, cyber fraud, um, phishing schemes and things like that, they're all attacks that are really, you know, focusing on the individuals within the organization, right? And what they're hoping to bank on is that they reach somebody with the ability to move money and there's not a proper control in place to stop that individual from doing it. So if the, if the, um, you know, if the, if the attack looks realistic enough, it'll be successful. I think we found that it has been, right? And um, because fraudsters won't let up on this, this specific type of fraud method here. And, um, and those attacks scale exceedingly well because they're easy to execute. So um, what do you really have to prevent against these attacks as well? So we think of it really in terms of layers as, as displayed kind of here in this diagram. 
But the most important one is the prevention. So the prevention is your inherent kind of um, financial controls you have in place. So do you have straight through processing in place for all of your payment files? Uh, do you have dual approvals? Do you have workflows in place? Um, are there secure authentication methods, um, multi-factor authentication for system logins, all these different methods here, right? Um, and if a process is properly secured from this standpoint, you're doing 95% of your fraud prevention already, right? Because even business email compromise attacks, fake invoices, they'll be caught somewhere along that chain. Um, the complexity to get there is obviously based on, you know, two slides ago showing how diverse a lot of the um, environments most organizations are dealing with are and the inability to really put in place a standardized process for a lot of these actions. Um, it, as a result, you end up managing everything kind of like separate processes versus having something to unify and, and standardize that. And then you have the detection layer. So this is your, um, your machine learning, your AI, your transaction screening type services that have a, a big place, I think, in the fraud prevention strategy here. But unless you've properly put in place the, the preventive methods, all you're going to catch is just like a lot of transaction activity, a lot of false positives. So you're going to be sorting through a lot on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we always caution organizations that come to us not to focus on this detection step first, but first look towards technology that can help you simplify the prevention measure, right? It's a lot more effective. And then the detection is really there to, um, to cover that last mile of risk, so to speak. And then you have the final preventive measures that I think are more organizational specific and probably, uh, you know, specific to the regions you're doing business in even. These are your sanction screening type products. The, um, you know, the, the, the protections in place so that if you do initiate a payment, even if it is a valid payment, are you paying somebody that's on the government no pay list, for example, or an industry specific no pay list? So um, these can be really effective tools for organizations, depending on your line of business and, and, and you know, the regions that you're doing business in as well. So. And then moving to the last slide here, this is just a, a table here that calls a, attention to some of the difference between fraud prevention and detection. And I think the most important point here to highlight is that prevention is for everybody, right? Um, you know, the, the most important thing like we highlighted on the previous slide is having the proper controls in place. And that's no different from company to company. Everybody needs those controls in place. So um, if you're looking for something for fraud prevention, the, the place to look, I think initially is, is in something that can help you really standardize the, those processes and, and put in place the right financial controls. The detection is organizational specific. You have to figure out kind of what that last mile of risk is or really what the inherent risk of the process really is. And then, for, and then put in place a solution that's going to protect against specifically that, right? You don't want to just default to fraud detection software because if you do, um, you're just going to be dealing with a massive list of, of, of um, you know, suspected hits on a day-to-day -day basis. You're not really going to know what you're trying to, uh, to detect against. So. All right. Thanks, John. Let me just kind of jump in here just for a second and talk about prevention. Uh, I really, I talk about this often as well. Employee education is really the most cost effective uh, way to make an impact. And of course, we'll talk about this later on in, in the payments fraud webinar in and of itself, but that's really key. But but let's just bring this back to visibility, right? You can't manage what you can't see, right? So prevention, we need to know uh, that we're at the risk are, right? And look at those in terms of people, process and technology. And I love how John couched this uh, between prevention and, and detection, right? You, you have to look at your company's activities and so I think that was incredibly important. So what about understanding what happened? So we're going to head, I know everyone's like, where's my polling question? So I know you're happy to have another one. Just asking you to share with us again on the visibility side, what percentage of your bank accounts do you have visibility into daily, daily visibility? Is it more than 90%, 75 to 90, 50 to 74, 25 to 49 or less than 25%? You may have less than 25% because you're international, but to me, I don't know if I could sleep at night if I had less than 25%. Um, so everyone, I appreciate your consideration in answering the polling question. Uh, anyone interested in receiving CTP credit, you'll have to answer uh, all the polling questions here today. So we still have some content to get through, of course. Uh, we always action pack. So let's go ahead and leave the polling question up for another few seconds, uh, and then we'll take a quick peek at the results, and then we'll uh, dive into understanding the why. So let's go ahead and give you five, Four, three, two, one. All right. All right. Let's take a quick peek. So we have a we have a great crowd here today uh, because 50% have more than 90% survey results, which I've seen and which I'll share mine. It's usually much, much lower. 
So thrilled to see that 79% of folks um, have at least 75%. So that's that's surprisingly really positive. How about you, John? What do you what do you think when you saw that? Yeah, no, I think the numbers are great. So just about 80% with uh, visibility into 75% or more, especially since yeah. I think the first survey reflected that most organizations were looking to get even more visibility into their right. accounts. I was thinking the um, you know, that these results would be lower than they are, but it's it's good to see these numbers where they're at. Exactly. Okay, so as I said, so I'm gonna share some results. Um, partnered with APQC on a survey last year delivering treasury success in the next normal. And uh, really our survey respondents, and we had a really good mix across different company sizes, but you know, we had more than 90%, we're only at 15%. So I'm gonna have to clap for you guys in the audience. And so we all wanna get to, right? We all like to get to 100%, but at the end of the day, sometimes we have to do um, that cost benefit analysis and see, right? Does that daily visibility uh, come into my come into my decisions on what I do uh, with my money? And so achieving cash visibility, you've seen this slide. It's like the hairball slide. It's like the gift that keeps on giving, right? Um, you need visibility, and the easiest way to get visibility is simplicity and to let someone else manage your formats for you. These formats are tremendously dynamic, um, and and they're not going to. Unfortunately, they're not. This complexity is only going to grow. So in, in, under, in understanding the efficiency of what happened, right? So how much did you pay to make it happen? I was about floored when I saw some of these results, um, but in a good way. Extent Treasury understands your bank fees. So we had 72% of companies say that they agree or strongly agree all their bank fees. And this is this one was really surprising to me in a good way. 81% um, uh, said that they benchmark their bank fees at least annually. I guess I would ask the question there, if I could, to these folks is how are you benchmarking, uh, you know, your bank fees? Because that is not an easy task, especially if you're not a larger organization. The information's out there, but to have the time to do that, right, is amazing. You know, how, how do you get that time? You leverage technology and you have visibility uh, into uh, what your challenges are. John, did then either of these results strike you as uh, optimistic at all? Yeah, I think so. The um... Yeah, about 75% agreeing that they understood their the the yeah. uh, their bank fees, which I, I know I didn't. It's my time as a treasurer. I had a little cheat sheet that grouped things into yeah. categories yeah. I could understand based on service codes. So yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, I used to manage the AFP service codes for two years, and I still didn't understand all the bank fees. So sorry, banks. All right. So the art of of uh, managing bank fees. This is my own little graphic. May, maybe I have another life as a designer, John. But <laughs> you have to have visibility, right? can't manage what you can't see you have to get vis visibility but you also have to understand what it means make your banker walk through you line by line everything they're charging you right what about benchmarking right afp has some good benchmarks there's free benchmarks out there now morally readily available just to compare i know there's some scenario analysis let you say what if i change my bank from a to b transparency oh man on my soapbox please why why don't we have transparency right? Uh, it's an information world. Let's let everyone make educated decisions. And guess what? Treasury people are really smart. They realize that they might not be getting the lowest cost, but if you're offering value, if you're offering credit, let us be educated, right? In how we're making our decisions. Predictability, right? We'd like to know, right? What we're going to be charged, right? Based on our activities. And then the accountability as well. Are we measuring those those fees, are these fees out of line? What's the accountability uh, for doing that? And so again, this is going in the weeds a little bit, so we'll gloss over this. Happy to send you a copy of the slides. Ernie at treasurywebinars.com. You have account analysis statements, I call it decryption. Um, again, there's different formats. I worked on the international BSB code many moons ago. Still has a lot of work to go, but we do the best we can. Um, you have to translate them into the common language, right? Across the across the across the uh, bank statements, and of course, the more banks that you have in the process, the more difficult that can be. Um, and so, anyway, it's just you need to you need to raise your bank fee IQ, and there are solutions out there that help you do that. Again, this is a cost benefit analysis. Uh, when I was back as a corporate treasurer, I met someone. They had someone full time staff. All they did was look at their account analysis statements and find errors. And, and they paid for their job. Now you should say, oh, they should switch banks. Well, it's not always that easy. So make sure that you get the level of visibility that you want to, 
but also look into these folks that help you understand those. Uh, there's more and more of those folks out there, so it's not quite as cost prohibitive. Um, so you want to establish a baseline, right? How do you do the baseline? Identify every account. Uh, do you need it? Centralize all your billing data. Evaluate and compare pricing, visibility, benchmarking. Measure the ROI for services. As I mentioned, we, we used to call it the, the treasury wallet. So how much money do we spend? What are we getting back? We get, okay, if it's not based on credit, are we getting a lower cost? What about our customer service to my team and myself? Evaluate your earnings credit. That's another webinar. And uh, evaluate your provider choices. No one should be safe in, in this world today. We shouldn't be afraid to make changes. Monitor efficiently. If possible, you automate your statement access. Create alerts and baseline for deviations. And so you know things are going to happen. Maybe you have an acquisition. Uh, maybe you've changed something in your payments. So let's make sure that those volumes make sense. For me, um, every so often I'd say, oh, man, how did we do, you know, I don't know, 200 ACH payments. Oh, okay, I get it. We just put our acquisition on payroll, right? Approve invoices before payment. I used to look at mine line by line back in the day, and I always found errors. Um, regular communication. And then let's review that pricing at least annually. And let's have some transparency. So this is what I would love from the bank. Okay, John, here's our here's our pricing here. You know we might not be the lowest cost provider. However, we invest in our own technology. We have a ded dedicated customer service representative. We value relationship and we offer you credit. So you shouldn't be afraid to have those conversation bankers. Be honest. And treasury people are really smart and we do value relationships. Um, anything you want to add here, John, on things you might have done to help manage your bank fees? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an important point here to, to monitor these statements month after month to look for the overcharges. I mean, during my time, it was always a constant process of identifying the uh, the overcharges, requesting the credits on the next month's statement, you know, reconciling month over month because um, because there are, you know, um, always errors on these statements. And then I think review the pricing lease annually benchmark to negotiate fees, both from a service level standpoint and then also an earnings credit standpoint, right, um, to make sure that you're getting a, a good rate there. Yeah, well, I have to tell an earnings story. And so since this was over 20 years ago, I'm not, I'm not going to say the bank. So I, I took over Treasury and we were being charged a fee for a system that our, that the company I was working for hadn't used for six months. So, <laughs> so, let's, so let's, that's an earnings horror story. So the first thing I did was I took every statement that I had and I brought the bank in and it took them like 10 people and they came in and they explained to me right? Every single thing. Make someone walk you through every single charge on your fee statement. That's what you should be willing to do. I'm sorry, Banks, but I had to say that. All right. You need to have, does John mention this continuous focus? There's a lot of verbiage on here. I apologize. So please don't try and read all these things. Just get a copy of the presentation. And so it has to be, it's a continuous process, right? As John said, review your cash management fees. You can use bank analysis software, right? Um, and you want to look at trends, right? What's There's variance. Okay, what about predictability? Oh, man, how did our wire fees go up 30%? Oh, right. Um, you should review discrepancies and current issues. I know I was, I, they called me bulldog, but try not to get mad when you're overcharged. Um, and then leadership and banking partners. I mean, let's do that. Let's do quarterly, right? I talked about share of the wallet. The other point which someone made, which is in, in extremely important, is to manage your signatories. John mentioned EBAM. And so also on the bank side, right, in addition to your fees, what about the risk management, right, with your signatories? Um, great point there. Thank you, Chris Malley. So, yeah, so that's something that I struggled with when I got to tell an Ernie story, John. So when I was in Treasury, uh, we had authorized signers who were deceased. So, so you know, you, nobody wants that. So, yeah. so anyway, and John said annual review. And align your company's needs with your partner's strengths. And I think that's incredibly important. So not only is it on the bankers, right, to give us the best of the best? We need to look at where our company is going, right? So some bank A may charge me more, but but I want to give them a share of my wallet because I want to get them into my credit group. I want them to help me uh, do an acquisition. So I think that's uh, incredibly important. All right, cash management success, understanding why it happened. Now, this is where Ernie goes into the weeds a little bit. So put on your bug spray. But this is, a, this is what visibility is all about. People process technology right on the ar side you need this visibility what's important here is that your internal team needs to work together 
we need to understand how our actions impact the customer experience, mitigate those efficiencies through technology, right? I look at cash application as communication. They're like, Ernie, please don't tell your story. I'm going to. We had one client, one wire, took us a week to apply the cash, right? In collections and deduction, but also no visibility. Uh, challenges have probably changed, right? As you're working from home. So let's make sure that we, you know, we can do this in any environment. We want that visibility again. Think, keep it simple. People, process, technology. When you understand what's happening, who controls, how it happens, when it happens, then you can see if it's visible, right, where your bottlenecks are, ways of improvement. And this has been extremely challenging the last year. I've been on a more accounts receivable webinars, but it's fantastic. It's overdue. I think we've all come to realize we impact the customer experience. Again, a lot of verbiage here, but just on your own leisure time, right? We all have leisure time, but you want visibility, people, process, and technology. Who does this? Who assigns? Who revises? Who management? This, this is probably a good thing for you if you're trying to train someone who's not your, if you're not the treasurer, right? Give this to your treasury manager, give this to your treasury analyst, show them the complications of the cash conversion cycle. Who does this? Credit reporting, approvers. Let's go into the process, right? AP process, right? This is how it works. Code, verify, authorize, send. So all you want, you need visibility into all of these areas. Getting that visibility adds value to your company. Savings and top line growth. Again, visibility into people. Who does this? In terms of AP, I've been talking a lot about AP the last five years, but I still love it. So AP, right? John's giggling on me. All right, so that's good. At least someone smiled during my webinar. I like that. So procurement AP approvers. Who are all the people involved? Get into the weeds, people. Technology, this is just a little COVID analogy um, from another strategic partner of mine that plays in that space, Stampley, but what do you want to look for? This is in any technology. Is it collaborative? Is it online? Is it mobile? Does it give you visibility? Does it learn? John mentioned AI and RPA. And does it give you diligence to enforce your controls, right? Mitigate frauds, demystify AP, demystify where the money's going, control how and when you make payments. Right. Look at the cost of when you pay and how you pay and work with your suppliers. Don't force them right on how you pay them. Now, we got all the way to the key takeaways. So, John, anything to add there on that visibility side of it that you want to add as I was rambling on there without stopping? No, I mean, all good points made there. I know that um, AP and AR are typically departments that um, maybe Treasury doesn't have direct oversight over, but you, Ernie, you mentioned at the beginning of the, the presentation, too, that it's important for Treasury to get plugged into those processes. You know, visibility into AR, your DSO is an important, um, you know, metric for cash flow forecasting. Likewise, the DPO and the payables process is an important thing for um, for Treasury to keep an eye on well for cash, as well for cash flow forecasting purposes. So the more visibility you have over those processes through through tools like what you mentioned before, the better, you know, the more accurate those projections will be for sure. Yeah, and just on this side of it, so as we have visibility, we see all the people that are involved. That helps us communicate better with those people, understanding what they do and how they do it, right? That leads to collaboration. And then just going back to payments for a moment, my suggestion is at least yearly, and I, I would I would hope you would have had this over the last year, everyone that's involved, let's just stick with payments, everyone that's involved in the payments process, anyone that impacts it, approves it, you should all get together on a call, walk through everything. Okay, what are the risks that we have? How do your actions impact the risk exposures that we have? How do we mitigate those exposures? So this education is incredibly important. Everyone in your company, you should you should test them on email. John touched on business email compromise. It's going crazy now, right? Just teach people. Don't open the email. Don't plug anything into your computer and then test them out. Don't go on your social media and, and let people know. People are smart. They go to LinkedIn. They figure out who your approvers are. They might connect with them on Facebook. Your people, it's not that your people aren't really intelligent. They're just not thinking about all these risk exposures. So let's go ahead and deliver some key takeaways um, before we uh, end our time with you here today. Um, you can't manage what you can't see. Just, just think of it that way and use that, right? So your CEO, your CFO wants you to do something, say, I want, we need to do better X, Y, Z, and you're like, I can't see it. So let's invest in that. Now I can do this, right? When I can see it, 
uh, treasury success means understanding everything that happened relative to cash movements and doing this in a uh, risk efficient manner. So the bank reporting is incredibly important, right? What happened, but also how efficiently it happened, right? On those fees, those communication fees that we have, you, we need to understand the why everything happened. So that's where I, I think we've made some progress, especially on the cash forecasting side. And then just a point, when you're identifying risk exposures, you have to have visibility into the people, the process and the technology. And then at the end of the day, uh, the foundation of collaboration is effective communication. So I'm going to go ahead and launch our final polling question um, here for you today. Um, as we have that question up, I would love to go ahead and once again uh, thank our webinar partner today, uh, TIS, uh, their strong commitment to thought leadership. I sincerely appreciate it and I share it and I can tell you they have it. I've been working with them for several years and it has been an honor of mine. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my webinar partner today, John. Um, thank you so much for speaking with me, John. It's always fun for me to have treasurer to treasurer uh, conversation. So thanks, John, for your time today. Yeah, thank you too, Ernie. Thanks for having me on. And thanks to everybody for joining as well. A couple other notes. I'm going to go ahead and leave the polling question up for another 10 seconds or so. Tre uh, CTP folks, wake up. The polling question is up. So I don't want to get nasty emails because you didn't answer the last polling question. So I really want to convey to everyone um, that myself, I sincerely appreciate all of you that have friends and family um, on the front line um, of COVID. And so we appreciate um, what they do uh, each and every day. Uh, I hope to see you all um, at, a, at a live conference here as soon as uh, the science lets us all uh, do that uh, safely um, in that manner. And finally, um, to everyone, um, until next time, make the rest of your day great, everyone.